Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Ron Kisen Stevenson. I recently read an article in Tricycle Magazine by Ken McLeod, who is a very well-known name in Buddhism, a very well-respected scholar, titled, Forgiveness is Not Buddhist. Uh, And he pretty strongly stated the following. I feel that current interpretations of forgiveness in the Buddhist community undermine the teachings of karma, encourage the cult of victimhood, weaken human relationships, and obfuscate the practice of purification. So, how is it that forgiveness is being used or misused in a Buddhist context? Well, uh, Ken McLeod points out two ways in which it is commonly referenced. Number one, as a way of letting go of expectations and our disappointments in others. In other words, what he says, he puts it this way, letting go of our attachment to a different past. Another interpretation would be the practice of loving kindness or metta. But neither of these Buddhist practices are forgiveness. Forgiveness unwittingly imports a fundamentally different system of thought and practice than our own. Why? Well, the term forgiveness derives from debt. By dishonoring someone, you incur an obligation to them, a debt that must somehow be repaid. By dishonoring someone, you incur that debt, So we learn to view interactions with others in terms of debt and balance, reducing our relationships to transactions. Is the score even? Who's keeping score? What if both parties are keeping score differently? What if you are on someone else's scorecard and they don't even know it? What if the debt of contrition that you feel someone owes you is not even on that person's scorecard? I mean, what if he feels the score is balanced or he doesn't even know how you feel? So how do you navigate this type of maze? It's confusing, it's confounding, and it's never ending. When relationships are reduced to balanced equations, human empathy is lost. Instead, we are left with maybe a vengeful God or a cosmic balance to live with. Nothing short of complete, complacent compliance and obedience will do. And that will come to define our life and practice, to dominate our lives. This expectation based mental pattern will forever generate alternately guilt or anger and satisfaction, regret and satisfaction over and over. So how does this impact our practice as Buddhists? The notion of a need to balance is an appeal to authority, whether it's an appeal to an omniscient God or to some principle of karma, if you will, some cosmic principle. It is still an appeal to authority. And that is what kills the religious experience of life. Substituting for the religious experience, a book of rules. And rules and equations, most importantly, have no humanity. And religion becomes devoid of humanity. Fundamentalists hurt others for the very same reason that you reach out to help them, to balance the books. 
They understand equity and justice just the same as you or I do in terms of cosmic balance. All that differs is the intellectual interpretation. So there is something we have in common with the religious fundamentalist, the bigot, those type of people. It is that reactive pattern of having to balance the scales. So let's think for a moment about the fundamentalist aspects of our own psyche, the fundamentalist within ourselves. Under what circumstances do you think a fundamentalist would forgive someone's sins? Under, with what conditions? Well, I came from the Catholic faith originally, and that holds in common with some other traditions that your sins are forgiven if you truly repent. No matter what the sin, a heartfelt conversion is forgiven by God. But then, of course, God is all-knowing. What about us? How are we to judge whether someone's contrition is real? And even if it is heartfelt, that contrition, what if that person is unstable and just reverts to his sins again? How do we judge that individual? That model only works if there's a hypothetical, omniscient, being a judge how can we presume to forgive a sin are we superior is that not really our ego rather than our heart is forgiveness really an ego trip well ken mcleod has one concern here and that is he's concerned that some people feel that when someone forgives them They've been absolved and the matter ends. Forgiveness in their minds completes the transaction. But does karma really work that way? I'll quote Ken McLeod here on this discrepancy. Karma is not based in transactions. It's based in evolution. Patterns of behavior set in motion by our actions, continue to evolve and shape our, percep our perception and our predispositions. That process does not stop until we change our relationship with those patterns. And that's what purification is all about. So what I do is that I set in motion a process that will ripen in time with my own experience. As Ken McLeod puts it, I've introduced some impurity into my experience of life. Purification's about removing the impurity so it doesn't fester and generate problems in my stream of experience. So that impurity in uh, that language, today we might say that it's nothing more than a regressive and malignant pattern. A pattern that ripens and metastasizes actually in your life experience. It impacts and taints your experience of life and your relationship with all sentient beings and all situations that you face. Another uh, way that McLeod sum summarizes it is this. Buddhist teachings do not advise asking others to absolve us from misdeeds. Instead, they outline a path to purification that will change our relationship to reactive patterns. So let's think this through for a moment. What if we completely do away with forgiveness and instead replace it with a practice of noting and changing our dysfunctional patterns? What if we replace regret and trying to balance the scales 
whether through revenge or guilt or contrition, with the practice of dealing more wisely with the karma of past actions in this very moment. In other words, the question here is how do we move forward from forgiveness to evolution? And as Ken McLeod put it earlier, letting go of our attachment to a different past, letting go of our expectations and disappointments in others is the way to do that. I'm holding on to a different past is what is the cause of our anger or regret. That within us that we feel needs to be redressed or forgiven. Let's take a look at regret or hindsight for an example here. We typically find ourselves saying, if only I'd acted more wisely back then, or if only I'd known then what I know now. What does that really mean? When you think about it, doesn't it mean that you would not make the same choice today, given the same situation? So what changed? Your awareness changed. Not the past, but your awareness. No amount of forgiveness can change the past. Looking at that thing you did that you now regret, you can perceive that you're really not quite the same person that you were then. In other words, at that time, you were not capable of being the person you are today. And the transgression was understandable. And perhaps that very transgression you made is one of the experiences that helped you to evolve. So how can we blame ourselves for past transgressions when we were simply not capable of acting at that time from our current state of awareness? Uh, Eckhart Tolle calls this unconscious, being unconscious. And that really means not being a very aware person at the time or relatively less aware than we are now. Now the same goes for our feelings of being wronged by others. That person too was acting from a state of awareness that made it impossible for them to do otherwise. I'll give you an example from my own life. Before Facebook, there were news groups online for discussions. Uh, these were called news groups or Usenet. And there were, there were several for discussions of Buddhism. And for years on these boards, I was hounded by a certain individual there who was exceedingly brilliant, articulate, knowledgeable, but very nasty. He would bait people, try to get under their skin, and then if they reacted, he would criticize them for it, saying, you're not very Buddhist. You don't have much of a practice if mere words on the screen excite you. So that was his method. Um, so for quite some time, I had some consternation about his grudge against me. I didn't know what caused it. And it was something I was trying to solve in my own mind. And one day, when he was taunting others uh, for reacting to him, he put it this way. He wrote, I am a many-armed monster reaching into the recesses of your mind. And at that point, someone retorted comically, you have narcissistic personality disorder. And when that was said something inside me changed. It changed the perspective. And I looked it up. And one of the things I found out about narcissistic personality disorder is that it is almost impossible to cure. It is a very, very intractable 
um, him, if you will. And at that time, all the questions and the doubts and the concerns I had disappeared because I realized that if this were really true, that he had no ability to change or act otherwise. And oddly enough, there was no need to forgive, no need to have my transgression, to have his transgressions redressed. All of the energy of the situation that had been building for maybe two years just dissipated. No amount of forgiveness would have done that. I mean, I could have sat there and tried to forgive. Oh, I'm going to forgive. I'm going to forgive. But the simple knowledge that things are as they are was enough. Um, so what do we do with regret or anger? If forgiveness can't stop them, perhaps they can be honored. Maybe they can be given a place in your collection of experiences that you now regret. Or better put, patterns caught in time to change. You can visit that collection of regrets from time to time, but you need not be enslaved by some sense of balance that can never be realized because it's only a theoretical concept. It's okay to feel regret. It's okay to feel anger and then recommit to the practice of catching reactive patterns and continuing to evolve in awareness. We are the catcher in the rod. And I'll leave you with this last thought on the subject. How do you expect to evolve in awareness if you do not keep discovering reactive patterns and freeing yourself from them? Why do you instead go around looking for sympathy and basking in guilt and anger over reactive patterns that are long past?